the theme for this course, the seven factors of enlightenment. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get enlightened. Would be nice if we did. But what it does mean is that we know what to practice because enlightenment is freedom enlightenment is liberation enlightenment is the end of all dukkha everybody know what dukkha is? I'm sure everybody knows what dukkha is but what does the word mean? (laughs) dukkha is our steady companion it's being unfulfilled it's everything that's not satisfactory it's our search for satisfaction our feeling inside that some little thing is still missing and that we usually try to compensate for by getting things from outside so enlightenment's the end of all that so whether we have ever considered the fact that we might get enlightened or that it's even worthwhile trying or whether there's any chance of it in this day and age there are all sorts of opinions about this it doesn't matter what our opinion is or what other people's opinions are what does matter are the guidelines the Buddha gave for a happy life because the end of all dukkha means happiness it doesn't mean uh, dancing with joy it means steady inner contentment so the seven factors of enlightenment are so to say the pathway in Pali they're called the bojangas which are limbs bow is the uh, short syllable for enlightenment like bodhi bow and janga are limbs and uh, they are the branches so to say or the limbs the first one and we talked about it last night but I will go into more detail now is mindfulness our old friend and it is very important to know what mindfulness really means how we can practice it so that it brings the kind of resultant that it's meant to do it stands at the apex of the seven factors of enlightenment not because it's more important it stands there because it's our entrance ticket if we don't enter through mindfulness the rest doesn't happen The same is with generosity. It stands at the apex of ten virtues, paramitas, or paramis. doesn't mean the other nine are less important. It's the entrance. It's our gateway. We've got to get in there somehow. And if we want to develop the factors of enlightenment, if we want to develop anything, at all if you want to develop the spiritual path we've got to pay attention we have to pay solid attention to what? to ourselves the Buddha said the whole of the universe O monks lies in this fathom long body and mind I dare say in those days they were using not feet and inches or centimeters and meters but fathoms so the whole of the universe is to be found in here so mindfulness attention is on here we have four foundations I mentioned those last night but I will detail them more explain them more and we are practicing at least two of them in every meditation we're practicing the first foundation kaya nupasana 
mindfulness of the body when we watch the breath or when we do walking meditation. We are looking at what the body is doing. And we're watching it and we try to become concentrated on that. And when we label the distracting thoughts, which is absolutely essential, whatever you've done before, whatever you're going to do after, for these eight days, label distracting thoughts. It doesn't matter what you've heard anywhere else, what you've done anywhere else. Don't compare, don't make judgments, just do it. It's the only way to get anything at all working for oneself. I've explained to you last night why the labeling is so important. Because it gives us an insight into our thought patterns, it gives us an insight into the impermanence of each thought, and it also shows us that we don't have to believe every thought that we think. And in daily life, it gives us the opportunity to substitute the unwholesome with the wholesome. Now, when we come to that, substituting the unwholesome with the wholesome, in the meditation, every distracting thought is unwholesome because it's not meditating. It's thinking. Thinking is not meditating. All of us have been thinking for decades, some decades, and it's been going along in the same pattern over and over again. So when we meditate, we have to get on a different wavelength. If we don't, what are we doing it for? If we want to use the same wavelength, well, we can go to the beach. It's near enough. It's got to be something else. So it mustn't be thinking. Obviously, it is very often. That's unavoidable when one hasn't practiced long enough, when one hasn't had the necessary karmic resultant to give it a quick result, whatever it is. It's unavoidable. The human mind wants to think. Now, maybe someone has wondered, should have anyway, why we do that. When we'd all love to meditate, we'd really like to do it. That's what we're here for. We came, some of us came a long way. I think I came the longest. But others have also come a long way from Canada. It's quite a ways. So we really want to meditate. Why don't we? Why do we think in between or a lot? We only have a support system for our ego, for our me illusion when we think. As long as we haven't quite seen that, we'll keep on thinking. It's the only support we can get. Usually we get more support than that. We talk to each other. Now we're trying to avoid that. That's a great support system. Somebody listens to us and is even um, reacting to what we're saying. So obviously, I am here. Now, we've only got the thought. And so the mind, with its ego as its underlying foundation, goes on doing that. So when we know that, doesn't necessarily mean that we can stop it, but at least it means that we know what's going on. It's very, very important. 
we consist of the thinking and the analytical and logical ability of the mind and the feeling ability of the heart. Both have to work together. They both have to give us their support so that eventually both are purified. And when both are purified and help each other, then we can really get along with meditation and insight. So at least we know, we understand what's going on within us. We understand that because we need this support, this um, underlying recognition that we are here, the mind has to think. So in order to avoid that, what do we do? Well, what we do is first of all, practice. There's just no substitute for practice. And in this uh, connection, I'd like to mention that we only have three and a half hours a day of group meditation. Please make good use of the time for individual meditation. Otherwise, it has occurred to me that you're not getting your money's worth. So please make use of the individual meditation time. I know it's very enticing to look at the flowers and to wander around in the beautiful place that we are here, but let it go. Practice. Three and a half hours a day of group meditation is not enough for an intensive meditation retreat. Now, in that time that we meditate, we can have a deliberation that meditation stands ahead of everything and me who's meditating is way in the back. You can try that. You can try something else. If you have already developed a feeling of love and devotion for the Buddha's teaching, for the Buddha as a great teacher. Put the teaching and the Buddha, or either one, Buddha or Dhamma, ahead of everything, and yourself way in the back. That works, but it's got to be practiced. Some people find that not so difficult. They haven't tried to be somebody important. We had a um, then newspaper in Sydney many years ago, and it was called Nothing Special. I thought it was a wonderful title. They changed it later to something else, but Nothing Special. Some people have that feeling about themselves, and they can actually put the meditation, put the Buddha, put the Dhamma, either one or all three, ahead of everything else, and not me meditating, me being interested in the Dhamma, me trying to compare what I've heard and what I'm hearing now, me, everything else except the me. If you do that, meditation works. Mind you, it's easy to say. It's not that easy to do. But it's worth a try. Because this is the stumbling block. I have a German book with the title, Without Me, Life is Quite Easy. But it's not been translated into English, so it doesn't do any good. Or at least most of you, some of you can read German. So that's the way it is in meditation. It's worth trying this, because that is our greatest obstacle, me doing something. The uh, second obstacle, which you may already have heard about and noticed, is the fact that even in meditation we want to achieve something. Me, who else? I mean, we don't really care whether the one on the next pillow is achieving something, do we? We really want to achieve something for ourselves. Forget it. It doesn't help. 
it's one of the um, other very difficult stumbling blocks. No achievements. There is nothing to achieve. You know what there is to do in meditation and on the spiritual path? Letting go. That's the key word. And every time things come up in the mind, just letting go. Remind yourself. Letting go. The more we can let go, the more we come to our original nature. Our original nature which doesn't have any problems. The original nature which is free and easy and has nothing to do with all the things that we occupy ourselves with. When we occupy ourselves with doing things, it's a natural outcome of having a body. But when we take those things seriously, it's a natural outcome of believing in me. So if you want to meditate to the point where the meditation really brings that which it should bring, a change of consciousness, me has to be put on the back burner. There is nobody sitting there meditating. There's only meditation. And if you forget, remind yourself of it. There's nobody there meditating. There's only meditation. The more often you remind yourself, which is an intellectual enterprise, of course, but the more often the mind gets into that frame, the easier it becomes to feel it. Remind yourself over and over again. Now, when we look at mindfulness, which is also often called bare attention, it's not judgmental. It is being here now. It's being in this moment. Now, we talked about this yesterday, that if you watch one breath, you are in this moment. And it is purifying. But mindfulness as we know it is not sufficient for spiritual development. And this is the most important aspect of knowing and understanding mindfulness. I'd like to repeat, we first have to understand what is going on in ourselves. As we do, we understand what goes on around us. And then, as we have understood it, then we practice it. And as we practice it, and we see what it does, we come to have trust in it. And trust is equal to love. So we need to understand with the mind and love with the heart what we're doing. If the latter is missing, and mind you, in the West it's often missing, because we, our tradition is not old enough and this part of it isn't stressed enough, we are limping along on one foot. Understanding is made easy for us because we've all been educated to use our mind. We have been educated to use our mind from the time we went to kindergarten. And we've been using it ever since. We don't find that very difficult. And to understand the Buddhist teaching is not difficult. But to love it with all one's heart, to be totally committed, to feel that this enters into one's being as the essence of one's being, that is not so easy to come by. Nobody taught us. We've got to teach ourselves. And as we teach that ourselves, the pathway becomes easy. Because that what you love is easy. There used to be um, a sort of an uh, um, appeal for donations for Boys Town and there was a bigger boy carrying a smaller boy and he was asked isn't that heavy and he said no he's my brother so obviously he loved him so it wasn't heavy it's the same thing with us if you want to have this path easy if you want to have it as a joy 
If you want to have it working, you've got to love it with all your heart. And when you do, you will see the beauty inside of yourself. That's the only way we can ever see the beauty inside of ourselves. Our mind might be very, very intelligent, but to see the beauty in the mind would be very difficult. But in the heart, it's there. So when we practice, then this is an important aspect, putting the me behind oneself and not in front. It's another important aspect. And the third very important aspect is mindfulness outside of sitting on the pillow. Now, very many people think that practicing means sitting on a pillow. Well, how often do people sit? One hour in the morning, one hour at night. That's already marvelous. One can congratulate them if they do. Most people that live in ordinary circumstances don't manage that. Some do. Some manage a little more. But what about the rest of the day? What about we have 24 hours of which we might sleep seven? So then that leaves us with 17 hours. Two hours of meditation, 15. What do we do in the rest? Nothing. Just make a living. It's a waste of time. One does have a make a living, yes. But to put that ahead of anything else is foolishness because it's only geared for survival and nobody manages that. Nobody has ever survived and we won't either. So you might as well look at what you do and see, is this for survival? And you will find that a lot of what you're doing is. But that should not stop us from using the time we're using for survival because we have to also for our spiritual evolution they can be used simultaneously so practice is not sitting on the pillow that's a means a means to an end an absolutely necessary means without it it doesn't work some people think it might, but um, I don't think anybody here does. We do have those means, and we have to use them, the meditation. But that's all it is, just a means. And then we go out. Now here, of course, we use more time for the meditation. But again, there are many hours in the day where we don't sit on a pillow, even in a course like this. So what do we allow the mind to do? Take a walk, hope for the best, remember the past, worry about the future, become aware of all the cravings we have which can't be satisfied here, or all the dislikes we have which have arisen for no reason whatsoever. What do we do with the mind? Are we actually watching it? Now, the labeling that we do in the meditation has to continue in every situation. Otherwise, first of all, we get the mind to be um, distracted to the point where when we sit down, we have to work very hard to bring it back to where it should be. If we don't allow it to be distracted, we have kept it in its place where it belongs, namely in this one moment. When we do that, it has no problem when we sit down on the pillow that it stays in place. So we have to keep it in place. So what do we do? Now the fourth foundation of mindfulness is recognizing the content of our thoughts which we label in the meditation which we label in everyday life and when we see 
that they are unwholesome, we substitute. These are called the four great efforts. They are four of the 37 factors of enlightenment. Sometimes we just use seven factors of enlightenment and sometimes we go a little further afield and make it 37 factors of enlightenment. And these four great efforts are four of the 37 factors. And they are worded like this. Not to let an unwholesome thought arise which has not yet arisen. Not to let an unwholesome thought continue which has already arisen. To make a wholesome thought arise which has not yet arisen. To make a wholesome thought continue which has already arisen. They are called the four great efforts, Padanas in Pali. They're great because it's quite an effort to do that. But if you keep on doing that, it becomes habitual. And whatever is habitual is no longer a great effort. But it's also called a great effort because it brings great results. You can vo uh, voice or uh, verbalize these four great efforts in shorthand. You can say avoiding, substituting, cultivating, and preserving. It's not difficult to remember. If we don't remember, we can't practice. Unless we do that, first of all, learn it here and do it in everyday life. Our spiritual practice cannot flourish. What we think we will say, what we say we might do. And the most helpful thought which can arise in this context is the recognition that when we think unwholesome thought, we are making ourselves unhappy. And that the greatest foolishness that we could possibly do. Why should we make ourselves unhappy? Not only do we make ourselves unhappy, of course, we make everybody else unhappy too. Because there are no observers, there are only participants. We all act and emote together. So we might, first of all, recognize the fact that it's foolish to make oneself unhappy. And secondly, we might recognize the fact that we have a responsibility towards the rest of mankind, and particularly those that are living with us, whoever they are. Whatever we think becomes part of universal consciousness, and everybody has access to that. In fact, it floats around in the air and people can feel it and know it. If we see that, we might feel far more responsible for our thinking. But there's another important aspect. Every thought we have makes karma. Every unwholesome thought makes negative karma. And in the end, very often, we're surprised why don't things work for us? Why is that person rejecting us? Why aren't things happening the way we'd like it to? They're karmic resultants. Every thought makes karma, wholesome or unwholesome karma. Of course, there's also neutral karma. But we don't recognize it very much because it doesn't have much impact. And also, it need not be considered at this point. It's negative and positive that we need to consider. And the more unwholesome thoughts we're thinking, the more accumulative is the negative karma. So who are we hurting when we dislike somebody? Only ourselves. 
And the problem with that is that we also think it is justified because the other person is doing something which is not right. Got to remember that what the other person is saying, thinking, doing is their karma. We have not been invited to be judge and jury. If we, if we try that, and everybody does, it's, um, it's a kind of um, entertainment that we have in the mind. It's useless. We haven't been uh, trained to be judge and jury. We get nothing out of it except negative thoughts and negative karma. The one thing we can do when we see that somebody is doing or saying something which is not um, positive, we can have compassion for the result that will come from that action or that speech. Then we are not involved with making bad karma. We can recognize what's going on but to be rejecting of it, to be angry about it, is absurd. And we all do it. That's why it's difficult to transcend the everyday mentality. That's why we need meditation in order to transcend it. And the same, of course, goes for our desires. It's the same thing. When we have desires, that too makes negative karma. And it's a little harder to recognize. Because with a desire comes a hope for fulfillment. And as we get the desire fulfilled, we may not have noticed, but we will, I hope, very soon, that having had that one desire fulfilled does not stop us from having the next one. Over and over again. So as we recognize what goes on in our mind, we will know what makes us unhappy. And when we know what makes us unhappy, we get a strong determination to find that which transcends unhappiness and brings calm and contentment. The happiness, which is called bliss, which Nibbana brings, is not, as I said before, a, a joyful ecstasy. It's calm contentment. Independent of outer conditions which is possibly the most important aspect of it. Because we've all tried over and over again, and probably are still trying, to make outer conditions conform to our wishes. It works, if we're lucky, if we have good karma, 50% of the time. And the other 50%, we deplore that it hasn't worked. We are sitting on a seesaw. It goes up and we dangle in midair when it has worked, when our desire has been fulfilled. And then, of course, as that is finished, because it can't last, we plop down again and hit the ground. And then we sit there and figure out how we're going to get up there again. It's not a satisfying way of living. And it needs to be recognized. Which doesn't mean that we can't have pleasant sense contact. But it means that we recognize their very um, impermanence and how short-lived they are and don't put our energy into trying to get our desires fulfilled. But rather put our energy into transcending our desires. It's a nice short sentence, isn't it? Transcending our desires. But it takes a lot of doing. 
I keep on saying that because the simplicity of the Buddhist explanations very often fools people into thinking, well, that's easy, I can do that. No problem at all. But when one actually tries, one sees, no, it's not easy at all. It's very difficult. But even one step on this pathway up this mountain already brings a different view. Imagine a high mountain and you've heard that everybody who's ever got to the top had absolutely pure air, was very happy, had a wonderful view, and so you decide you ought to like to get up that mountain. First of all, you need a guide who's been up there. I can't stress that enough. Imagine you go, let's say, mountain climbing in the Himalayas without a guide. Not only would it be difficult, it probably would be disastrous. But probably, most likely, not survive. With a guide, it's possible. But it's still hard work. But even taking one step up that high mountain one is already removed from the valley and one has a different view. So with a guide, it's possible, but we can only take one step at a time. And that's also mindfulness. To be totally connected to the inner steps we take, also to the outer steps. Now I've talked about the thinking process that we are aware of or like to become aware of or already have been aware of. And then there's the body. Huh? And we must use our body also as a mindfulness object. And as we do that, we will get a different insight into it than what we usually have. Now, obviously, we all know how to be mindful to survive. I mentioned yesterday, if we didn't, we'd already have been run over on a busy street, we would be cutting our fingers off and we peel potatoes, we would never be able to dial the right number or touch the right, touch tone the right number, or what one calls that these days because we aren't mindful enough. We can't write a proper letter. All these mindfulness aspects are ingrained in us because they're necessary for making a living, for getting around in daily life without too many difficulties. If somebody is totally without that, they probably can't handle daily living. So we all have that. It's within us and therefore it can be cultivated. But to the mindfulness on the spiritual path is a different and much more in-depth going aspect of mindfulness. It gives us, first of all, insight into the first level of insight, namely that mind and body are two. That they are interconnected, but they're not the same thing. There has been for many years a sort of a movement trying to make it all one it isn't possible. And if you want to make something, obviously it isn't that way. What it is, is there's the mind and there's the body. And the mind's in charge of the whole thing. Not a single body would be sitting here if the mind hadn't said, get in there into that hall and listen to the talk. So all the bodies wandered off and sat down because the mind said so. 
There wouldn't be a single body having come to this course if the mind hadn't said, oh, I better go there, I might learn something. So then the bodies appeared. Okay, in walking meditation, experience that yourself. It's logical, isn't it? It's totally log logical. It's uh, absolutely clear. But you've got to experience it. All the things that the Buddha said are absolutely logical and clear and they are most of them. There's no way that we can prove the opposite. But if we don't experience them ourselves, they're just an interesting sidelight on all the other information that we already carry around and which is cluttering up our mind. When we experience it, we call that biting into the mango. If you've never eaten a mango, which is unlikely in California, I suppose you do have them here somewhere, but if you've never eaten one and you ask somebody, what does a mango taste like? A person might tell you, it's very sweet, very juicy, it's delicious, it's uh, soft. Well, it could be a peach, couldn't it? But when you bite into the mango, you don't have to ask anybody. You know what a mango tastes like. That's it. Finished. You never talk about it. You know exactly what it tastes like. It tastes entirely different from a peach. It's the same with experiencing those things that the Buddha talked about. Told him, called himself the show of the way. Now we have to actually experience it. So, for instance, when you get up from your pillow, watch the mind saying get up and the body following suit. In the walking meditation, let the mind say start and you start. And then the mind says, no, nah, I didn't mean that, stand still. So then stand still. And then maybe you're going to experiment and let the mind say three, four, five different things. And of course the body has got a clue what it's supposed to do get all confused. Experience it. Try it out. Make it happen. And as you make it happen, you'll never again think that mind and body are one. They are two with the mind in charge. Obviously, we react to the body. When it has pains, we react to that. When it feels pleasant, we react to that. We react to it with the mind. In that connection, the Buddha has said that an unenlightened person has two arrows that hit them, and an enlightened person has only one. The one arrow that is being shot at the enlightened person are the unpleasantnesses of the body. But the unenlightened person has both has the unpleasant sensations of the body and the unpleasant sensations of the mind. So when there's only a body, then, and we actually experience that, we don't have to react to it. So as we practice walking meditation, sitting meditation, we may have some unpleasant sensation, particularly in, in sitting meditation. If we're not so used to sitting in this position, then we may have an unpleasant sensation. This is a very good learning situation. It's excellent. What we do with it, we can actually watch ourselves react to it. Now, in the beginning, the reaction is immediate, impulsive, and has happened before we pay any attention. So when we do and become mindful again and pay attention, we can go back to the beginning of this reaction. We have touch contact. It's one of our sense contacts. All sense contacts create feeling. This one has created unpleasant feeling. Now we are not 
usually aware of the next step, which is perceiving, perception, the labeling. Maybe we label it pain. But we certainly can be aware of the fourth step, the reaction of moving away from it, changing position. And as we do that, we can try not to react. Look at it again. Touch contact, unpleasant feeling, painful, no reaction, back to the breath. Everybody can do that at least once, twice, three times. And then when the sensation, the unpleasant feeling has come the fourth time, the mind might say, oh, well, that's very interesting, but I can't sit like that. Okay, move. We don't believe that we have to force ourselves to the point where the mind becomes negative. The mind is negative enough without having any other support system for negativity, namely the unpleasant sensation to which we are reacting. But we would sit and try to remove ourselves or remove that which we consider is the cause for it, which is only a thought. The cause lies within us. All that is mindfulness to the point of the spiritual development. In other words, we need to realize what we're doing and why we're doing it. And as we realize what we're doing and why we're doing it, we also know if we're interested what everybody else is doing and why they're doing it. And if we have enough sense not to become judgmental about ourselves, we will have enough sense not to be judgmental about anybody else. It's a great learning experience and we can start with the sitting position. Watch it, become aware of it, and see what we do with it. But if we don't sit, if we are outside, and for instance, the sun is too hot, so we try to get away from it into the shade, obviously. I mean, there's no point in not doing it. But watch the whole process. Again, we're being touched. Again, we get an unpleasant feeling, too hot. Again, we say unpleasant or whatever it is. We, don't, we are usually not aware of that, that we're saying that. And we try to remove ourselves. And because we have many, many, many unpleasant sense contacts, we are constantly busy trying to get away from them. We also have many, many pleasant sense contacts and we are constantly busy trying to get them again. That leaves very little time for transcending the everyday marketplace mentality. There's no time left. We've got to run away from the unpleasant and run after the pleasant. All of humanity lives like that. The meditator must become aware of it and eventually minimize this busyness, this um, effort to get something which is not available. Constant, pleasant sense contact is not available. If we see that now, we are being mindful in the way that spiritual evolution takes place. Mindfulness is not only knowing that I'm getting up. Mindfulness is not only knowing putting my foot in front of the other. That's part of it. And that's how it starts. But it's particularly knowing 
what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And maybe you can see from that also that running after the pleasant and avoiding the unpleasant cannot possibly make good karma. So there we are already in a situation where we are definitely making bad karma. Obviously, we try to compensate for that. And we wouldn't be here if we hadn't compensated by doing good things, being loving and helpful, kind and considerate. And yet, it can only keep a balance. The good karma can never be overriding as long as we don't watch this. And as we watch it, we become aware of the futility, we become aware of the energy expended, and we become aware that there must be something more. And that something more, that's why we're meditating. So mindfulness gives us the first step of insight, that mind and body are two, that the mind's reacting to the body, and that we therefore put ourselves into a position where we have where we are making a lot of bad karma. The second step of insight, which is also uh, not difficult to see through the mindfulness of the body, is the arising and ceasing. The impermanence of everything that is not only body, but also mind. You do walking meditation. I mentioned it as if you're getting agitated or sleepy. You can see quite clearly that every movement has to start and finish. If it didn't, if it doesn't have that kind of content of beginning and end and then beginning again, we'd be a corpse or a pillar of salt. We wouldn't be people. Same goes for the breath. Each breath has to begin and end. Now people in the world, everywhere, take their breath for granted. I'm sure we've been guilty of the same. They only notice that they have breath when they lose it. They become short of breath, they choke, drown, have asthma, coughing, then you notice it, that you really need your breath. Very few people watch their breath in terms of arising and ceasing, in terms of every breath, breath is finished and a new one has to start. If it doesn't, we'd be a corpse. If we do that here, where we have not only the time, but also the peace and quiet to look at that and not take breathing for granted. Breathing is a manifestation of being alive. And being alive is a manifestation of being like a little stream. A stream flows. If you want to hang on to any part of it, put your hand in to get a bit of that stream. It all runs through your fingers. All you get is a wet hand for a few moments. You can't get hold of that stream. It's the same with us. There's no getting hold of that stream. It's moving all the time. Mindfulness will show us that if we pay enough attention. Don't allow the mind to have wishes, desires, and dislikes. You can do that all again after next Saturday noon. <laughs> it's all available. It's constantly there. Right now, look at it from a different angle. We say that the Dhamma of the Buddha is 180 degrees turned around from everyday 
um, mentality, from the way people look at it in everyday life. It has a connection, sure, there's a body and a mind, but that's about all. The way we look at it is entirely removed from the Dhamma. So try to look at it in this time here from the angle, from the viewpoint of the Buddhist teaching. Impermanence, which is depicted in the breath, in your walking, in everything that's happening, is always covered over by continuity. That's why people can't get at it. Each breath is followed by another breath. So obviously, breath is there. That each breath has to be followed by a totally different one, we can only find out through the meditative path and through seeing the Buddha's teaching. The continuity of getting up in the morning every morning for years on end makes us believe that there is a solid entity. That's nothing but a belief system. Because the continuity of getting up every morning has brought us to be complacent. And this the complacency is our one of our worst enemies. The complacency when we think, well, so what? I just want to meditate to have a little more pleasant sensation, to have life a little easier. Been having a few troubles, so now I meditate be easier. That's not at all what it's about. Meditation is about changing the whole mind stream to the point where we see things the way they really are. To see things the way they really are is the first step towards the insight that brings us to liberation. It's called Jnana Buddha Jnana Dasana in Pali and we usually translate it as knowledge and vision of things as they really are. But vision doesn't mean that we have visualizations or have visions of everything. Not at all. It means the inner seeing, which is the experience. Wisdom is the understood experience. There isn't a single living being in the whole world that doesn't breathe in and out. That means life. That's the experience. Well, we've all been breathing in and out for a long time. That's our experience. But have we understood it? Have we understood it to the point where we realize that we are nothing but a phenomena that's breathing in and out and we've got to continue breathing in and out to be alive and if we don't, we're dead. And when we think of dead, we'll probably get scared even though we like to think we're not, it's very rare that a person has come to the point where they're not. And we'll talk about that at another time. What I'm trying to show you is that proper mindfulness will bring insights that are far removed from the way we usually look at ourselves and the rest of the world. Because there's a body sitting here which looks solid and which has the same consistency as other bodies. We think of ourselves as a solid entity. Watch the breath going in and out and immediately you will find there's more transparency. It's not quite as solid. Watch yourself moving in walking meditation or in being mindful of walking. And the solidity gets a little bit knocked on the head 
and you see that there is something else there which you hadn't really taken into consideration. As we find ourselves more transparent, less solid, we find ourselves more aware of our impermanence through mindfulness. Many of the problems which we think are so solid slide off our shoulders. The problems which we have or think we have are just as not solid as our breath. They are all made up in the mind. If we don't make them up, we don't have them. This is another very important point which you may be able to connect with through mindfulness. That you can only know and be aware of that where you put your mind. Everything else has disappeared. So why put one's mind on something that one considers a problem? It's totally unnecessary. Obviously the mind's going to revert back to it. It's like a, a little dog worrying a bone. But eventually we can educate that little dog to stop worrying the bone, leave it where it is, and get on with life. There's no need to put one's mind where it doesn't have any business of being. Now this is obviously helpful in meditation. Put it where it's supposed to be. And when it doesn't want to stay there, give it a good talking to, lovingly. And consider it, but determined. We have two other foundations of mindfulness. I will talk about the second one tomorrow. I'll mention the third one now. We've talked about the first one, the body, and the fourth one, the content of the mind. The third one is very often called mind because it's called chitta nupasana and chitta means mind. But it's actually moods. Becoming aware of one's mood. And most people have predominant moods. A lot of people have a predominant mood of dissatisfaction. They just don't like things the way they are. Other people have a predominant mood of craving. Since they don't like the way things are, they want something. Other people have a predominant mood of trying to see their pleasure in everything that surrounds them. They're lucky. It's not insightful, but it's pleasant. And then there are people who have a predominant mood of rejection, dislike. And those people, the latter, of course, have all sorts of justifications. Of course there's something wrong with the world. Why shouldn't it be? There are very few enlightened people. Very few. There are at least six billion unenlightened ones. So naturally, it's not the way it's supposed to be. At this point, I usually tell the story about my four-year-old granddaughter who was screaming her head off. And I said, why are you screaming? What's going on? She says, nothing works the way it's supposed to. I said, well, that's right. You're quite right. Very insightful. But... <laughs> But screaming isn't going to help. Not at all. And she said, well, nobody's listening to me. I have to scream. We're doing exactly the same thing. We just don't scream. We do it in other ways. Nothing works the way it's supposed to. She's absolutely right. And then we get worried, angry, irritated, upset, disliking, judgmental. 
and then we think it's somebody else's fault. Somebody is fixing it so that it doesn't work. Who? Well, the partner, always the nearest person, very easy, very easy to put the blame on. The boss, the people next door, the uh, other people we live with, don't have any idea how to be nice to one, appreciate one, don't appreciate anything one does. We can, the politicians, the president, the atomic bomb, what, whatever, the weather, we can always find something that is the cause for our irritation, for our dislike. And having found that, what do we do? We are against it. So we're making bad karma. In reality, what's really happening is this. This is a jack-in-the-box. Mm -hmm. And this little jack-in-the-box comes out when we touch it. There it is. Now, everybody, every one of us, has that little Jack or Jill in the box sitting in there. Some people can be touched very lightly and the thing jumps out. Others, you have to touch a little stronger and then it jumps out. But if somebody comes along and takes the Jack in the box out of the box, we can be hit with a hammer. It won't come out anymore. That's our reactions. Nobody is at fault. Everything's a trigger. We're being triggered. And some people get triggered all the time. Some people get triggered half the time. They're lucky. And anything in between. But what it really is, it's a jack-in-the-box. That's all it really is. I was given this especially for this purpose. Notice it in a meditation course where there's silence. Nobody's saying anything to you. Nobody's even coughing. There aren't even any airplanes. There are no trucks, nothing at this point. There might be at another time. And yet, all of a sudden, you're disliking somebody. They don't look the way you think people should look. Or they don't sit the way you think people should sit. Or they don't act or eat or, or do whatever the way you think they should. What business is it of ours? It's only giving a little bit of food for this jack-in-the-box. Naturally, the jack-in-the-box is one of our identifications. So it needs to be fed. It needs to have some support system, otherwise it's going to die out on us. Let it die out. It's so much more pleasant to be without it. All these things arise through mindfulness, to knowing what one is thinking, saying when one is talking and doing. Knowing what one is doing with one's body, the body is a very important aspect of mindfulness. I've already mentioned our meditative experience with it, the breath and the walking. But we've got this thing with us all the time. And we call it me. And we're vitally concerned with it. And yet, it's only a servant. Sometimes willing, sometimes unwilling a servant to the mind. And yet, we look in the mirror and we say, oh, that's me, looks all right, or oh, doesn't look all right. And there's this strong identification with this outer form. Mindfulness changes that. It's not indifference to the body. That doesn't help either. Indifference 
is putting barriers up. It's seeing things as they really are, the understood experience. That's how wisdom arises, from the understood experience. So mindfulness opens the door. It gives us a pathway. It makes it possible. That really strong attention. Obviously, without being mindful, we can't meditate either, because mindfulness is being in this moment. And I like to repeat what I said at the beginning. Put the meditation, put the Buddha, put the Dhamma ahead of everything else. Put yourself in the back. You can all scramble that around again after next Saturday. But for the time being, let all that be of the utmost priority. And as you do that, you may feel trust and love developing. Trust and love only becomes very um, total when there has been a personal experience of that what the Buddha taught. But trust and love for that what one is doing makes it possible. If one has constant judgmental ideas and comparisons and personal opinions, nothing works. Let it all float away like a black cloud and sit in the sunshine of the Buddha's Dhamma. It is brilliant, but only when we see the brilliance in our own hearts, then it connects to that brilliance. It's not only intellectually brilliant, it certainly is that, but it is also brilliant because it uncovers the jewel within us. 